Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In your dissection of the infratemporal fossa today, you exposed it in your previous dissection, and you should remember that this is a deep area. It's covered by the superficial muscles of mastication, and you had to remove these in order to expose this region. Now, today's entire dissection is going to be focused in a very small area, the area bounded here by the area I'm circling. The thing that's important for you to realize is that in your previous dissections, you've had to cover relatively large areas and move relatively rapidly. In this case, you have a lot of structures and a lot of relationships that are extremely important to dentistry. Take your time, dissect them well. You don't have a lot of area to cover, but cover it well and do it in an oriented fashion. The important thing is to understand the boundaries then of this area and the muscles that you're going to be needing to relate the neurovascular structures to. Here, for example, is the medial pterygoid muscle and its posterior boundary. You should be able to locate that boundary as well as its anterior boundary. Understand the relationship then of the medial pterygoid to the muscle which overlies it, the lateral pterygoid, and realize that lateral pterygoid is made up of an inferior head and a superior head and that a cleft ex exists between these two heads, which can be demonstrated or located, perhaps, by following back the buccal nerve. After you have understood the relationships of these muscles and the neurovascular relationships of the various features of this region to the muscles, for example, here we can see one of the nerves you have already labeled, this nerve then is the nerve to masseter, which passed above the superior head of the lateral pterygoid. The next thing you need to do is to reflect the lateral pterygoid muscle and temporal mandibular joint in an effort then to follow the deep path of the nerves and their branches of the mandibular division of five. These are going to issue out from the foramen ovale on a fascial plane, the interterygoid fascia, a fascia which is the medial aspect, or rather lateral aspect of medial pterygoid and lies medial to the lateral pterygoid. To do this, we need to identify certain features of the temporal mandibular region. For example, the auriculotemporal nerve. One should identify it and reflect it so that we are able to examine the area of the temporal mandibular joint as we remove it. We want to look, for example, at the maxillary artery. Look for branches supplying the temporal mandibular joint as you reflect this area. You will want to take your probe and work deep to the joint to make sure that you know its boundaries. And once this is done, we want to cut the joint from its superior attachment to the mandibular fossa. You should also then unpack the lateral pterygoid muscle by cutting it and removing it in such a way as to maintain the neurovascular structures. Anteriorly, the lateral pterygoid muscle should be entirely scraped from its origin in this region. Now in this next specimen that I'd like to show you, we have in fact done exactly these things. Here, we have left the temporal mandibular joint in place just as a point of orientation. Here again, then, is the cut surface of the mandible. The joint can be removed. I might say that this is your chance to open up the upper and lower cap cavities and examine the disc and make sure that you know the structure of that temporal mandibular joint region. The first thing we want to consider when we remove that area is an artery. The maxillary artery, which is going to pass here, you can see it arching beneath the area of the neck of the condyle, 
and passing into the infratemporal region. The maxillary artery you will find is divided up into three parts, one which is deep to the neck of the condyle and whose branches all disappear into bone, one which is in the muscular region and has branches going to the muscles of mastication, and the final one you will not see, it disappears into the pterygomaxillary fissure in this region. Be careful of that fissure. It is going to have nerves passing out of it as well as having the maxillary artery passing into it. Once you've identified the branches of the artery, we can reflect the maxillary artery by cutting it at the point of the junction of the first, or excuse me, of the second and third portions of the artery. This will allow us then to reflect the artery and remove it from this area so that we can examine the contents of the fossa. Now, as we do that, let's first look at some of the landmarks of this region. One important one, which you have uncovered in your dissection of it, is the lateral pterygoid plate, which is shown here. You'll notice that the medial pterygoid passes deep to the plate. You can see that here. And that the lateral pterygoid muscle has been completely scraped from its attachment to the plate and to this infratemporal aspect of the maxilla. If we look superiorly in this fossa, we realize that the infratemporal fossa is divided then from the temporal fossa, which lies above it, by the infratemporal crest, which is here. The roof of this fossa is bony and represents then a portion of the sphenoid bone. Two important foramina are going to enter the infratemporal fossa, or nerves will enter and arteries pass out of the infratemporal fossa through two important foramina. One is the foraminal valley, which we can begin to see here. And this is transmitting then the mandibular division of five. You can see the edge of the foramen here. And right posterior to it, we can see an artery, a branch of then the maxillary artery disappears in the foramen spinosum. And by rocking that artery forward, we can see the spinosum is here. Needless to say then, this is the spine of the sphenoid. Now, the next thing that we want to consider in this region is in fact the observation that the interpterygoid fascia, which lies on this medial aspect, excuse me, lateral aspect of the medial pterygoid, does span and form a sheet on which these branches of the mandibular division pass. The mandibular division should be followed back now, its branches determined. There are two features which are frequently lost in examining this nerve, and I'd like to show you those now. Those are the relationships of the corda tympani to the lingual nerve and the auriculotemporal nerve's relationship with the facial nerve. In doing that, however, I'd like to point out something about nerves in general. Frequently, the nerves do not form a single trunk, but rather may form that trunk rather belatedly, as you can see here for the inferior alveolar nerve. We have one trunk joining it and finally getting around to forming a single trunk by the time it disappears behind the lingula. The lingual nerve has then a branch which comes in and I think we can see that best if I were to take and reflect the inferior alveolar nerve right now. We'll cut it at this point and roll it off to the side. And you will notice then passing from the uh, lingual nerve that we have an attachment here of a second nerve, the corda tympani. Now the corda tympani can be shown to be the corda tympani by following it in fact back to the point where it disappears in the petrotympanic fissure rather than through foraminal valley. The last feature I'd like to show you then is one which is associated with the auriculotemporal nerve. To identify this region, 
we need to recall that the auriculotemporal nerve passed onto the temporal aspect of the head, past the base of the zygomatic arch. It has a unique arrangement with the middle meningeal artery. And you'll notice another interesting feature of that nerve at this point. And that is that the nerve splits around the artery. It passes on to the side of the head. But also, there are fibers which come over in this direction and join a part of a facial nerve trunk at this point. Now, the facial nerve trunk you can see here actually disappearing down into the styloemastoid foramen. And you can see the connection here of auriculotemporal with the facial nerve. This is an important feature in facial pain, especially of the mid-face. In your dissection of the parotid gland fossa, you may have broken this connection, but you should at least, in following the auriculotemporal nerve, watch for this relationship. Finally, once you have studied these branches then of the mandibular division, we can reflect the lingual nerve as well as the inferior alveolar nerve and look for the otic ganglion on the medial aspect of the mandibular trunk or the base of the mandibular trunk as it exits foraminal valley. Do not be too disturbed if you're not able to find a discrete ganglion, but you should at least look for the area and attempt to identify this ganglion at this time. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.